We're in the midst of a global pandemic. Billions of people around the world are worrying about how they're going to survive it physically and economically, while the U.S. empire sees it as a perfect opportunity to advance. This new reality exposes the great contradictions of the current world order. So-called enemies of the U.S., Cuba and China, are exporting hundreds of doctors and medical supplies, while the capitalist icon United States doles out death abroad and trails the world in caring for its own people. First claiming COVID-19 was being used as a Democratic Party hoax, now Trump boasts it'd be a great success if only 200,000 Americans die. Most Americans who don't know how they're going to pay rent can clearly see how the recent $2 trillion bailout prioritized corporations and billionaires, handing out billions of dollars for candy dynasties and cruise liners. But what's more hidden is how the U.S. empire is using the pandemic outside of its borders, too. Long-standing U.S. policy has left dozens of countries on the brink of collapse, making it near impossible to brace for the inevitable. Few more so than war-stricken Yemen, already suffering the world's worst humanitarian crisis from the five-year-long U.S.-Saudi bombing campaign. Since the assault began in 2015, there have been at least 120 attacks against medical facilities, crippling an already devastated medical infrastructure that couldn't deal with civilian casualties from war, let alone the outbreak of a deadly pandemic. But here, the U.S. has also escalated amidst the crisis. Trump is moving forward with a drastic reduction of aid that would cut most of the support to the country's already battered health sector, including critical assistance to crowded camps and water and sanitation networks, places where COVID could spread rapidly in short periods. The bombing continues too. On March 30th, the U.S.-Saudi coalition launched 19 airstrikes on the capital city of Sana'a, killing at least one person. To further destroy this densely populated city, where most of the COVID response will take place, is criminal. It's hard to comprehend how any government could take such drastic measures to kill even more civilians at a time like this. While world leaders are calling for an international ceasefire, that hasn't stopped the U.S. from dropping bombs. Since the virus outbreak, U.S. drones fired down on a bus in Somalia in mid-March killing six civilians, including the bus driver, a local farmer, and a 13-year-old boy. It won't be the last. U.S. claims it has a small footprint in Africa are debunked by internal documents that reveal a staggering 29 bases. Since this is all top secret, it's hard to know what else will be taking place on the continent under the cover of COVID. The first COVID-19 case hit Afghanistan in February. Occupying U.S. troops there have also tested positive. With decimated infrastructure, the Afghan Health Ministry estimates that at least 100,000 Afghans will die from the virus. It came as a relief then, when on February 29th, the Trump administration signed a surprise deal to end the war and bring all troops home in about a year. After years of negotiations, the Taliban accepted this deal and a ceasefire began. But just hours after bragging of the talks, the U.S. had resumed airstrikes on Taliban forces, once again ending the end of the war. And that's not all. Afghan sovereignty to the U.S. government means they have to follow Washington's orders. As the combat drags on, the Afghan government is being punished for not pleasing the White House. On March 24, the Trump administration said it was cutting a massive $1 billion in aid which will have a devastating impact on the nation's ability to brace for the health crisis. In Iraq, the U.S. empire's other forever war, a new escalation is happening. On March 27, the New York Times published a secret Pentagon directive aimed at using the coronavirus to destroy so-called Iranian-backed militias. Killing Iranian-backed forces is just code for killing anti-U.S. Iraqis. As the document states, some top officials have been pushing for aggressive new action against Iran and see an opportunity to destroy Iranian-backed militia groups in Iraq as leaders in Iran are distracted by the pandemic crisis in their country. The directive detailed a list of targets in Iraq to bomb, leaders to assassinate, and shockingly, 
included Iranian ships to attack. Even the top U.S. commander in Iraq admitted it risks a full-blown war with Iran. While it's unclear if this is moving forward in its entirety, the plans have been drafted and have already been implemented to some degree. On March 13, the U.S. bombed a wide variety of Iraqi targets. And on March 14, it's believed that another Iranian general was killed in a U.S. airstrike. The very act of reckless belligerence that put us on the precipice of war mere months ago. Additionally, while masses of Iraqis are protesting the occupation and the pending health crisis, the U.S. decided now is a good time to send even more soldiers, deploying additional Patriot missile systems with hundreds of U.S. troops to operate them. In the same Imperial mission of oil dominance, U.S. troops are still patrolling in Syria with the open intention to control the oil fields. Today, increasingly in combat in a war that was supposed to end. This is coupled with U.S. approved airstrikes on the Syrian state by its attack dog, Israel, the latest on March 5th. The Syrian government has petitioned for an ease in sanctions to deal with the pandemic. But on March 17, the U.S. responded saying they would tighten them instead. While the Iraqi and Syrian people bear the brunt of the empire's military destruction, justified by countering Iranian influence, the Iranian people are suffering casualties from a different kind of war. The 800 or so sanctions Trump imposed on Iran were already killing civilians from lack of medical supplies and set the stage for the devastation they're now experiencing from the outbreak of COVID-19. Iran is the hardest hit country in the Middle East surpassing 2,600 deaths as of March 29, with one person dying every 10 minutes. These crippling sanctions are causing an unquantifiable amount of unnecessary suffering and death. But the Trump administration has defied all pleas from the international community and even from Congress to ease them. Unthinkably, the U.S. is adding even more. We are announcing new sanctions on the regime. Um, it's, it's a kleptocracy. It's this Marxist, theocratic kleptocracy. On March 26, the U.S. imposed new sanctions that punish politicians who support removing U.S. troops from Iraq, restrict the sale of Iranian oil, and even attack a charity that maintains holy sites. This scenario is exactly what sanctions are for. It's a dream come true for the imperialists. See? This is what you get when you don't play by our rules. They can blame the government for ineptitude, building a case for regime change on top of a growing pile of bodies. As Pompeo declared, the Wuhan virus is a killer and the Iranian regime is an accomplice. Murderous sanctions are not the only act of aggression by the US empire in Iran. On March 13, two additional aircraft carriers were sent to patrol the Arabian Sea the first time this has happened since 2012. The new naval mobilization expressly threatens military strikes on Iran. And on March 23rd, the US and United Arab Emirates publicized a full-scale mock invasion of Iran, actually constructing a fictional Iranian city for troops to conquer and destroy. The message of these operations is quite clear. While your nation is suffering and dying, we are taking another step towards war. In Venezuela, even bolder moves for regime change by the Trump admin. The democratically elected Maduro government has arguably taken the most pro-working class approach to the pandemic, with a six-month rent freeze and outlawing layoffs. But in the face of U.S. sanctions, they are still in crisis. Before the pandemic, U.S. sanctions on food and medicine had directly killed over 40,000 Venezuelans, according to the Center for Economic and Policy Research. So on March 13, right after Venezuela got its first confirmed case of the coronavirus, the U.S. imposed even more. These sanctions target the country's oil exports, the source of almost all of its income. In desperate need of help, Venezuela went to the IMF on March 18 for an emergency loan to prepare for what was on the horizon. The U.S. made sure it was blocked and the loan was denied. But maximizing physical and economic death in the nation wasn't enough for the U.S. empire. 
So on March 26, Washington took their biggest move for regime change since the failed U.S. coup attempt in January 2019. In essence, they placed a kidnapping bounty on the head of Maduro, offering $15 million for his arrest, with $10 million bounties on other top officials. This provides even more incentive for U.S.-funded opposition forces to fulfill the dream of a coup from within. Ironically, the real narco states are the closest U.S. allies, like the governments of Colombia and Honduras. Uh, Nicolas Maduro must go. We must get this democracy started. We have now introduced this pathway to achieve that. We've made clear uh, all along uh, that Nicolas Maduro will never again govern Venezuela. On March 31st, they published a transition plan where the U.S. promised to lift all sanctions on Venezuela if the socialists leave office. To escalate the threat, Trump announced on April 1st he was doubling the amount of warships, aircraft, and special forces troops off Venezuela's coast. While the Pentagon is using this pandemic opportunity to beef up occupation forces throughout Latin America, those directed at Venezuela are a dangerous step towards war. I would like to begin uh, by announcing some important developments in our war against the Chinese virus. It's the impact of the Chinese virus on our nation's students. The Chinese virus. The Chinese virus. I talk about the Chinese virus, and uh, and I mean it. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? Because it comes say from it's China. Racist. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. China, the country the U.S. foreign policy establishment has declared the enemy and perpetrator of the deadly virus, has it mostly contained, and is now in the process of aiding other inflicted countries with supplies of desperately needed medical equipment, including millions of masks and thousands of ventilators and protective suits. In a time of much needed cooperation between the two countries, Anti-China hawks are seizing the opportunity to push hardline policy against China, as well as anti-Chinese racism, key to war propaganda. Politicians like Tom Cotton are making the media rounds to assert COVID-19 is an engineered Chinese bioweapon. This unfounded conspiracy isn't just the ranting and raving from a lone senator. It seems to be a coordinated attempt on behalf of the same warmongering neocons that advocated the invasion of Iraq. Now, with the same premise, to confront China. Allow international inspectors into your labs to disprove the claim. Furthermore, Matthew Pottinger, Trump's main architect of policy on China, is one of many turning up the economic war, advocating to sever ties, which will put even more strain on the medical supply chain into the US. It's not just war-hungry neocons, though. Corporate media outlets across the political spectrum continuously delegitimize China's aid delivery as propaganda efforts by the communist regime to, quote, curry favor with our allies. This all translates into much more. As the virus takes over, the U.S. is conducting mock battles with the Chinese Navy in the region as a threat. Just last week, the Navy launched live-fire missiles in the Philippine Sea. And throughout March, it's conducted regular military exercises in the South China Sea, something China has called a hegemonic act that violates international law and threatens peace and stability. The Pentagon sees open war with China as inevitable, not because it poses any threat to us, but because it poses a threat to capitalist profits. So this pandemic is being used as a golden opportunity to fast track this new Cold War. Even U.S. allies are being put on notice as they struggle with the outbreak. Cuba's world-renowned doctors and their effective virus treatment are being requested by dozens of governments in desperate need of help. But the State Department has issued an official warning to not allow this aid that would no doubt save lives, simply because it would legitimize a government the U.S. is hell-bent on overthrowing. Taking advantage of the pandemic to further demonize Cuba, and claim all their international solidarity is just a front for communist dictatorship is unconscionable regime change propaganda with deadly consequences. So far, at least 53 countries have joined the call for an international ceasefire so the world can band together to fight a common enemy, COVID-19. 
at a time where global cooperation has never been more urgent. Countries are stepping up to show true international solidarity. But the U.S. empire has brazenly shown it will only weaponize the crisis, making disregard for life its official policy. Here at home, Americans anticipate the worst, left to suffer and die by their leaders in a corporate sacrifice zone. Rich politicians love to say that we're all in this together, but it's clear we are not. It's just those of us who were screwed by the corporate bailout and those abroad living under U.S. domination who are all truly in this together. One thing is for sure, there's no going back from this moment. This crisis exposes the true nature of our imperialist system. But that also means that together, we can turn our collective hopelessness into collective radicalization. 